Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. This is uh, Daniel Guys from ED Films, the art and technical director. I'm, right now, I'm just showing a clip of some of the work I've been doing, uh, been working on. This is all After Effects stuff. None of this is Maya or 3D. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what I thought I would do really quickly is I was working on a Stalin character in the last tutorial, and I sorted that character out and got him working. And I thought what I'd do really is maybe show how I put them together really quick. So I'm going to break this stream into two, two parts. I'm just going to... Um, Show how this puppet works, which you really don't see much of in this shot. Um, and then what I'll do, and then I'll stop the stream just so I can split it up. And then we're going to move into compositing a another big scene for another project. But what I thought I'd do first is show you how this, this puppet worked, which is also very similar how this guy here works. Um, but we can, we'll check it out. So let's just go to the actual puppet here. So this is the rigged character here in After Effects, and I've I've done a, done a RAM render of RAM preview of his animation. All the animation, most of it is just driven by a f couple of controllers. So you'll sort of see most of this animation we can barely even see on the screen. I mean, when it's at 4K and in the movie theater, we'll see a lot more of it. So it's sort of important to be there, but at the same time, I kind of made him a little bit more elaborate for the sake of demonstration. But you can see there's a lot going on. Uh, I feel like he moves pretty good. I animated this guy in about an hour, an hour and a little bit. Once I had all the controllers and everything in place, it was actually really fast. Um, the broad movements of his body are done with just a few keyframes. So I'll just show you right now. Let's go here. And we'll just check out the actual keyframes of this character's animation. So there's not much. I think I'm looking at all of them. Most of his movement is driven by the, this look at controller right here. You can sort of see it moving around. I've got his whole body rigged to his motion controller right here. So maybe what I'll do is I can go to an unanimated version, or maybe we can just I can just delete some of the animation on this guy. I'm gonna save it back up really quick. So you guys can see how he works. Just zoom it all the way out, and then I'm just going to delete all this amazing animation. Gone. Okay. And then these ones here. What are those? Oh, that's a posterized time effect. That was for the transition, the switch between the arm. We go from I go from a I go from an arm sitting like this to an arm that's sticking out. That's just a switch. So I want to just make sure, put that switch back to zero again. But I just put a little switch on his arm. So I'll, I'm just going to go through. <clears throat> I'm going to go through the, the general setup of this puppet. And how he works. Come on, here we go. There we go. So that turns that arm off, and this one should turn this one on. These are just some custom things. So most of this puppet is this is a mix between some custom rigging stuff and uh, Duic tools, just some basic Duic stuff. Um, also, if anyone notices I have audio problems, let me know. I've been having a bit of trouble with my microphone, so just let me know if you can't hear me for all one of you that are out there. Um, okay, so this character is primarily custom rigs. Um, a little bit a little bit of Duic. The Duic is used on the the inverse kinematics for the arms. And they seem to be having a bit of selection issues, as usual. Turn. I'm going to turn this effect off. Maybe that's the problem. There we go. OK, finally. All right, so I fixed the problem. <laughs> I had this posterized time effect on. My bad. Um, that's embarrassing. So I can run this guy in fast draft mode. And in fast draft mode, I can turn him around. So let's just review the puppet from scratch. Let's just pretend we're starting this all over again. Um, Hey, hey, Thoreau's, and I don't know how to pronounce R-B-E-N-C-Z. I don't know how to pronounce that, but welcome to the stream. And yeah, you're right. When I'm uh, uh, when I'm streaming, things do get a little bit slower. I think it's because there's more stuff going on. 
but I did fix the problem here. So now it was because I had an effects layer on top of everything, and that's to posturize the time to make the character look a little bit more hand animated. So let's start from scratch. We'll just start over again and review this puppet. This is the puppet that I used in the these shots in this this film this little film project right here. So I'm just going to pan them over, and you can see the finished shot of the character. Let's just go take a look at it one more time. So it's pretty short. I mean, for the for the shot that it is, the rig is probably overkill. Um, but I did want to demonstrate something that was a little bit more elaborate. It was really fast to animate because of the way it was rigged. I did a whole bunch of different takes, and I was able to get something that I was pretty happy with quite quickly. So let's just go back to this guy here one more time. And... Um, yeah, that uh, throws that hair thing. That's actually happening because it's in it's in fast draft mode. Um, fast draft can can have like weird little visual artifacts because it's not good at sorting out the depth. It's called depth peeling, I think. Um, and that's sort of that's that's when the computer decides what object goes in front of another. And so fast draft is not good at that. If you if I were to put it in just a final quality mode, um, you're going to see that doesn't happen. And I guess my computer's fast enough to run him in final quality mode without a problem. So maybe we'll just do that since it looks a little bit better. So the idea behind this puppet is that uh, I can kind of act him out in real time. So I've got this all this stuff happening as he looks around, his body weight shifts, and uh, you know a lot of a lot of the thought I put into him is based on my understanding of movement and the way people's bodies works. You know, so if his head is going to look over really heavily, there's there's a there's a, a, a need for the human body to try to balance out, right? So especially if you're in a standing position and you don't have any momentum, the general like, rule of thumb for me is that the, if, you, if you put your arm out, for instance, your body slightly shifts to offset the weight of that arm to keep you balanced. And so that concept being in play here is that I try to offset motion with other things that will help either balance the character out or sell the movement a little bit. So just to give us some more dynamic movement, I'd like him to feel more like a puppet and less like a real, real human. Uh, so you can see a couple more things that I did is that as he lifts his arm, there's a subtle shift in his body weight moving over. So as the weight transitions over on this arm, his body moves over. Um, as you can see, his shoulders moving up and down. And I have the um, these guys right here. So I'll just turn these on. The clavicles are pretty active in this this specific setup, so you can see that they're moving, they're rotating as he moves his arm, and that just gives that extra level of life to him. So there we go. And I wasn't really worried. Like there is some intersection stuff where his shoulders coming up. I didn't worry about that because he wasn't doing that kind of a move in the animation. And plus, I could have just mass clipped that off at any time, but I left it because it wasn't necessary to worry about. I had to do this guy pretty quick. Um, the other features he has is he has these little eyebrows that I made, which I showed the build of in a previous video. So you can check that out if you want to, but you can see them in action in the main composition here. So I can just sort of like animate them up and down. I can animate them separately. So he can be like, what? So I have a, a pretty limited, a nice limited range of expressions, but it's actually, I feel like it's quite a bit more than enough, especially for the shot. I could do a lot with this guy. And this, because, the, I mean, the coding that I'm doing is really quite simple. So I'll get into that in just a moment, and we'll just sort of review it really quickly. Um, what else does he have? He has a breath slider, which I use a lot and is quite important to me. I use it all the time. Um, not a slider. I don't shouldn't call it a slider. I'm using rotators now, like uh, null objects to rotate on. And the rotations, it's just so I can use my number pad to actually animate. So I'm not... Trying to go into, I'm not having to go into an effect and adjust a slider and keyframe that. I'm literally, I get auto keys as I, as you'll see here on this guy right here, and then I move ahead a few frames by just pressing shift down, and then I'll like press minus and then shift down, and then press plus, you know. And so by doing that, I can get, I can I can animate really quickly. The same thing with the blink and the hands. So I put, so here we have the, I think the blink is right here. So on the blink, these I just do holds, like I do, I have them keyed as hold frames. So I'll just press plus once, and then I'll move forward, one, two, three, plus twice, one, two, three, that. Um, and uh, Thoreau's is asking if I showed how I fixed the foreshortening. 
I actually ended up just rem- just cheating it all together. I kind of gave up on it because it wasn't quite working the way I wanted to. Um, it worked on a, on a different character that I had done. So I'll just show you right here. This guy here, the four shirt ink trick r- worked quite well. Um, as you can see, I mean, it looks a little weird if you really look at it because he has a whole bunch. It's mostly because it had to do that beveling effect on stuff to try to round things out a little bit. But you can see this one is made up of three different sort of circular pieces. Um, what I found is with the Stalin, as soon as I tried to add a puppet tool inside of the foreshortening, it was it was making too much of a mess. It wasn't working very well. So I ended up just giving up on that that approach altogether. And I just went for sort of this stretchy arm. There's this one piece. I just made a custom piece. So let's just check this out really quick for his forearm right here. I just made a custom piece and made a shape layer and made a new piece and put a sleeve in there. And then I just puppet tooled this thing. So it's a nested composition. And um, in there, so from this one, this here, I, I essentially just, whoops, I essentially just puppet this guy. So it's like, there's like a, there's a two little puppet pins on them. So I'll just turn these on. You can see like my little bones for the puppet pins are there and one's in, one's behind his hand. So I, I ended up just attaching that to this, this whole system. I'll show you really quick how it's actually working. Um, it's, it's pretty much the same idea as the foreshortening thing. It's the same kind of code and the same everything. It's just simpler because I'm only dealing with two values instead of, instead of three or four pieces. So there's not as much going on there. I just ultimately took the forearm here because I can't use inverse kinematics on it. If I, if I used an in inverse kinematics on the arm, it doesn't actually work because it main, tries to maintain the distance between the wrist and the elbow. And I think that's a feature I, I want, I would, I would like to see added eventually because I end up having to do them all myself, is to have a stretchy arm where, you know, right now when you, when you go into do it, let's say for instance, I'll just turn on the, the pointing arm I have. I'll just show you. You, you probably already know this throws, but I, I'm, I'm reviewing this more so people can see um, as well. So please forgive me if I'm treading very familiar ground. So right now in Duik, when you do a inverse kinematic arm, you have a couple of options in the, in the controllers here. And you can do, you can do a stre- like some stretching. You can enforce stretching, which will like sort of loosen up the, the actual joint. And then, then you have auto shrink. Now, I always wanted it so that I could say, like, let's say his arms like this, I want to shorten the forearm, you know, because maybe, maybe he's pointing a little bit or it would have helped the transition because I have a transition that goes from this arm here and it comes up and then, then it switches to this arm. And I have no way to shorten that forearm unless I have to create my own custom code. I didn't really have time. So you, you have this auto shrink, but th- that's like, it's handy in some ways, but it's sort of useless in others because it creates all these uh, little artifacts here. So you'd have to go in and manually animate. So I kind of feel like if these were puppet pinned, it would be nice to be able to shorten limbs, um, which is not, it's obviously, it's probably not easy to program. So I obviously don't expect it. It's just something that's, it would, it would be a nice thing in the future. Um, so what I ended up doing is the way this is is pretty simple. Let's I'll just check out we'll just check out the code really quick on the the arm joints right here. So I know it looks like there's so much going on. So it seems really intimidating, but when you're working sort of one step at a time, it's not so bad. Okay, so let's go. We're looking at the right arm. We want these two. Okay. So I'm just going to let's isolate them. So these are the two the little arm controllers here, and here's the forearm. And let's just go, we'll just check out really quick the code on them. It's pretty basic. It's in the position value, I believe. Oh, geez. It's in the position value. So let's just go here and here. Oh, I got rid of my switches. These are actually just parented. So um, this one is parented to the wrist controller right here. So as this one moves around, let's just go to, there we go, wrist right. So as this one moves around, it just follows. The back pin is parented to the humorous elbow, right? And that's where the code is, is sitting in here. So let's go down here to the humorous elbow. 
humerus elbow right. We want humerus elbow right. There it is right there. Now this one, it's not parented to anything. There's just a little bit of code on it. So let's just hide this. So I, I've just created a little a variable called wrist position. And this is actually just looking at the point of origin of the controller, the hand controller. So this guy right here. And it's basically saying, just like I've, I've demonstrated before, take this guy's position and add whatever the change is to the position of this elbow joint. So it's saying, take a look at that position, subtract its original starting position so that we're looking at zero. So it's everything starts from zero. And so now what we can do is we can add. So whatever happens here, whenever this moves, it's going to add a certain amount. It's going to add the difference from you know, uh, 1352, 644. It's going to add that difference onto the x value here multiplied by 0.4. So what I'm, I'm basically saying to it is like 40% of that movement, apply it to this elbow right here. So this kind of stuff, like these numbers I don't know by heart. What happens is I, I sort of feel them out and I experiment. But I use this exact system over and over and over and over again on this whole puppet. There's very little code on this puppet. There's really nothing elaborate, more than the fact that it seems really complicated because there's a lot of pieces. But all of these pieces are doing very much the same thing. The one thing I did want to bring up that I did really cheat on, which is the clavicle right here. So the clavicle I got from Duick. Um, you, ought to, you can add a clavicle when you're doing your, your setup for the actual arm rig here. And I just did, when I'm using the Duick tool here, I just went into the rigging, the auto rig, and I auto rigged a hand. And I included a clavicle joint. And that's like, that's just this thing right here on your neck. And what this allows, that's what this does is this allows the, it kind of brings the shoulder up and down depending on how high the arm goes. Because in reality, in real, real joints is, your shoulder doesn't move independently very far, right? Like it kind of either like this, but it can't, it can't go up. So to bring it up, you actually have to, your whole shoulder blade moves and everything shifts up. So this clavicle is actually really important for flexible and believable, you know, less rigid animation. Um, some mistake I see is sometimes is that the shoulder is just like independently rotating as this free object, which it can't do. So the, this code here is actually created automatically by Duick. But what I was able to do is parent my shoulder piece, my shoulder uh, pin right here, way down here. This shoulder right here, I just parented it to the actual clavicle itself. So now, whenever, so this little humorous arm point bone here, so let's just turn off, I'm gonna turn this guy off because he's kind of, he's kind of getting in the way. Um, and I should make sure that that value will be animated, which is kind of annoying. Um, so that now when that, so that bone right there is going to move up and down because it's actually parented to the clavicle. So when I move this up and down, it goes with it. So all my shoulder, all my shoulder pins and stuff like that are just parented to that. So, oh, hey, hey, Brooks. Nice to see you. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming online. Um, I'm just this is unofficial. This is an unofficial stream, so we didn't really publicize this or anything. I'm kind of doing these right now just as a test and sort of see how it goes. Um, okay, so um, when the, when the arm moves up and down, we actually we actually adopt some of that movement in the clavicle, and I was able to do this with a lot of different things. Um, I was able to use the clavicle to drive the arm movement and the breathing. So part of the breathing controller up here, this breath, is actually manipulating the clavicle. So they're moving them up and down. It's also adding a little bit of motion to these guys right here. So if we just take a look at the chest position, I'm taking the breath the breath controller value here and adding it to the Y position of the chest. Really basic, like nothing. Yeah. And so I just want to show you really quick um, how I how I kind of commandeered the Duick code to make it so I could add a value to the clavicle. It's maybe a bit a bit advanced or it's not really like I was really scared to touch this, but what I realized is in the end here, 
they're just doing this. <laughs> Thanks, Brooks. <laughs> uh, Brooks is just saying he won't tell anyone that these are unofficial. So kind of kind of keeping us on the DL right now. Um, so in this result here, it says result equals. So we have the result minus the layer rotation. So I was able to stick this little variable of my own in here. I didn't put it here. I left this alone. I put it right here. So in this spot, I was able to add on top of the code that Duik is creating automatically. So it's going to be very intimidating, but it's not actually not that bad. I created my own little variable up here, and this should actually probably have a semicolon. And then I just stuck it in at the end. And what that allowed me to do, oh, it shouldn't, good to know. Uh, what it allowed me to do is sort of commandeer this little clavicle and add my own values to it. So that was, so I could actually add a breathing, a breathing function on top of it and still maintain the functionality of this. The other thing I want to sh show you, which maybe you noticed, is that this controller here, which is the IK controller for the arm, see it, you can see it moving and changing the clavicle. In order to use the, the clavicle's influence, I just I made this controller here adopt the X and Y position right here, as you can see, of this guy. So they're sort of, it's sort of just taking over. It's kind of a quick and dirty way to like get that clavicle working because the math and the stuff is so complicated. I didn't even want to touch this and try to figure out how this worked. So I'm just, I'm just commandeering it and getting all that movement from the character. So the last thing I want to touch on this guy really quick for just for the, the idea of how to get the movement, the believability out of this character and the, a bit of the mass is all about time, uh, doing some time shifts on it. So what I'll show you is, so as you can see, this character, is, as he's moving around, all these other joints are kind of doing other things. These are my primary joints where most of my code is. This character is made up of a number of pieces, but those pieces are all, they're all kind of, they're puppet tools, they're puppet pins, like little pins in his, in his back and his shoulders and all that kind of stuff. So you can see here, let's just take a look at this stuff really quick. So these are just the pins on his back. They're all just parented to different things. I have the code really only being driven from a couple of different places, but all the different layers on his body are these pins, these puppet pins that are created into it. And you can check it out how I made this in the previous video. These pins are just actually being pulled around because they're parented to other objects. So I, there's really no code on any of them. It's mostly just these main guys right here. So on these guys, these are my my primary controllers. So let's just get in here and make them move around. So you can see this is this is what I'm using to kind of control his head and his neck. So that one can go up and down. These can be animated manually or they can be animated with code. They're sort of a mix of both. So if you take a look up here, I'm gonna show you, this is a really pretty standard approach I usually take. It's really not that complicated. I've defined the breath variable, and that's just looking at the rotation value of this breath guy right here. So any animation that comes off this guy is going to affect the position of this, this chest piece. And then I'm also taking the look at position. So I'm just looking at this controller here. Where is it? What's it doing? And I'm just tracking that. And then I'm subtracting at starting point. But you might see this like this here, this value at time is really important for me. And this is how I kind of, I make it so all the movement doesn't happen at once. So if I add this little dot value at time and I'm subtracting 0.2, I don't know if it's 0.2 seconds or what I'm subtracting exactly, but if I go time minus 0 0.2, what that does is it slows down the reaction of this, this body piece. So let me just show you really quick. If I animate this position here and I go here and I pull this over really quick. And let's just render that out. I'm just going to just do this really quick. What we should see is even after we've passed the keyframe, there's a slight time where everything still keeps moving. It's pretty subtle. Um, you, you could exaggerate this even more. And I usually think the bigger the characters, the more I exaggerate this time shift. It's just a good way to create drag and secondary motions that kind of that fall behind the lead of the driving force, right? So he's looking around, his body settles a little bit after after he does. Now an ideal thing, an ideal way to approach this is to create what's called a linear interpolation and slow down the speed of the movement. So if this moves really if this look at point moves really fast, for instance, 
that the body would move slower instead of with just instead of just a value at time delay you would actually slow down the value it's a lot more math and it's a little bit more tricky for me at this point so i didn't bother um, just for the nature of the character what i was doing was moving fine so you could use what they call a lerp to to change how quickly it goes from this value to this value and have it be slower and the slower it goes the more mass it feels like it has but you can also a way to cheat that with a simple little thing here is just to add a time offset so actually as you go up the body um, let's just check this one here i think it's in position i actually reduce the offset of the time you know so anything i'm doing with time i will move as the mass decreases like so the chest is heavier the the core of the body is heavy so that will have each piece will move slower and slower or lag behind more and more as it gets heavier and heavier. So the head, my general rule of thumb is with the head, everything moves instantaneously. If this guy had pupils, the pupils would follow this look at thing to the, to the second, like to the instant. And then the head would lag behind by just like a little bit, you know, just by like 0 0.02 or 0 0.03. And then as we move down the body, it lags even more and more as the mass increases. So it gives you a little bit more of a natural sense that the eyes have zero mass, so they move really quick, and the head's a little bit bigger. And then when you have a really cartoony character, you can slow the head down. He has a giant head. You can slow the head down even more really quickly and dynamically just by increasing that, that time delay. Um, okay, so hopefully that, that helps a little bit. It shows a little bit of what's going on. It's all pretty basic stuff. I have a little bit of math in the rotations of these things and basically what this is doing is what I have happening is as he looks over this way just to add uh, because of his motions it was a it was I needed to loosen him up a little bit so I added a rotation based on the look at so when he look at looks this way his chest rotates slightly that way and then his neck rotates slightly that way but his head always stays up so what I did with his head controller is I applied, if you go here to Duic, and you go in uh, out of auto rig, we don't wanna be in auto rig, we wanna be here. You can apply this little guy right here, which is a, um, it's it's an orientation, it keeps the orientation locked, so you can just select what you want and you click this, and what'll happen is that object, no matter what it's parented to, will not rotate unless you rotate it yourself. Whoops, so his head, for instance, it won't rotate. So if I rotate the neck, you can see his head always just stays up. This is important because heads don't usually flop all over the place by themselves. Usually they try to stay fairly stationary or focused on whatever they're looking at. So this kind of orient control on the head is really important. I use it in walks and runs a lot because your head isn't bouncing up and down. It tries to stay pretty level. You know, your world tries to stabilize. So it's kind of important to animate this. Plus you don't want to have to counter key. And counter keying means that if you do a rotation, here, for instance, um, and you rotate the chest, and the head then rotates down, you don't want to have to create new keyframes to push that head back every time. So it can create really messy animation. Let me just get rid of these keys here. Okay, so I think, I, I don't want to go like bore you to death with all these details. I just want to show, the last thing I want to show is how I animated this guy, and then we'll move into the other stuff that I wanted to, that I have to work on today. So, Let's just take a look. I'm going to show you how, how I usually work with the animation. For, so because, again, I'm not much of an animator, uh, I like to try to find ways to move the animation along as quickly as possible and give me as many options as possible. What I did with this guy is I've got these key controls. So let's just hide all this stuff away for now. I really don't need to touch these. I never ended up touching these at all in the final animation. Um, the only things I'm going to really be controlling are the arms the hands here and the, their poses. So I've got right here, I've just got these little rotation things tied to some poses for the hands that I made. So I can just rotate them through. Um, just for, I guess for a really quick reference, I can just show you really quick here. The way the hand, the pose system works is it's basically grabbing the rotation value of that hand pose right here. And it's saying, if the hand pose rotation equals zero, make it the opacity 100%. Otherwise, make its opacity zero. I have used like nested. Um, oh, it, okay. When throws is saying when my video is on screen, it blocks a Duet panel. Yeah, you know what? Like I, yeah, I'm on the fence. If you guys like having a video of my head, 
<laughs> it's I'll, I'll keep it in, but I'm really on the fence about it. Like I'm not sure if it's standard practice or not. I can move it um, or make it even smaller, which I'm totally comfortable doing that as well. Um, or even just moving the Duic panel altogether. But thanks for the thanks for the heads up on that. So yeah, just let me know. I'm not sure it's if I even need to have my little video in there. Um, but anyways, I won't be doing much of Duic for now. Um, but I hope, yeah, it probably blocked the other video when I showed how to doing the rigging. So hopefully that's something I, I'll need to work on. Mm, okay, so maybe what I'll do, let me just double check here just for the sake of keeping things manageable. Maybe I'll just turn this off for now. I'm going to turn my face off for now while I demo this stuff, and then I'll turn it back on later. Okay, cool. All right, so what I'm, now what I'm going to do is I just want to show you how I animate this guy. So I have these little cues I set up. Uh, I used to have the animatic in, in there so I could actually see what the animatic was doing. But then what I want to do is I want to record this through a performance. So I set up my timeline right here. I don't want it to start till here. I'm actually going to use motion sketch. So let's bring this. I think it's called motion sketch. There it is. And I'm going to use this to animate my character. Because I've created all these controls, now I can I can actually puppeteer the character, which is pretty fun. So I also just want to turn off, well, I'll just leave everything right now, it's fine. This is a little bit of a mess. I don't. I usually lock everything and kind of clean it all up so that I can't do anything too crazy. Oops, okay. So let's just, let's go ahead and animate this guy. So I'm gonna pull back. I've got these cues that I set up. Um, if you're not familiar with how to set them up, you can just press the star key on your number pad and it will set a marker and then you can name it. So like if I have here, um, for instance, I knew that my camera would be in right here. I can just go in here and double click and say like, uh, cam, or sorry, Stalin visible. So this is sort of saying that at this point, I know Stalin is in the frame. So here we go. So now what I can do is let's just puppeteer. This is actually the fun part. So after I've done all this setup of the rig and kind of got the character working the way I think, I can always tweak stuff later. That's not a problem. But now what I can do is I can start my capture. So I'm gonna go start. I'm just gonna start drawing. So in my thing, he's reading this document. So I have him reading, 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 reading. And he kind of looks down. Hmm. And then he's going to look up, put his paper down, and then he's going to point away. So he's going to anticipate over this way, and then he's pointing. So this is weird. The thing, in, the thing about After Effects, which I don't love, well, you'll see this other weird thing happen, is I can't see when I'm puppeteering. That's the only real downside. But that's one of the things that we're actually working on here in the, in the studio is creating some real-time animation tools in Unity that allow you to see what you're doing while you're puppeteering a character. So... Now you can see also that this position jumped all the way over here, and I'm not sure if it's because it's parented or why it does this with most things, but I keep all these frames selected, and all I have to do is just return this controller back here. As long as everything's selected, I'm just holding down Shift, and I'm moving the controller back to where it was, which was, thankfully, I kept this frame, 0 and negative 550, and that's where everything starts. So we'll do negative 550. There we go. And this should be zero. You can't just type the value in. If you type it in, it's going to replace every single keyframe with that value. So you have to manually slide it in, unfortunately. But it's not that big of a deal considering how much movement we get. So now let's just have a look and we'll just watch it. So this is me showing him reading. Reading, reading, reading. And then, actually, let's just zoom out a little bit so we can see the timeline. The nice thing about this method too is I can just record another one. You know, if I don't really love it and I need to rework it a little bit, I'll just record another one. So he looks up. And so this is when there's going to be the guard in the frame. And then he's like going to do some eyebrow stuff or whatever, some breathing. And then here he kind of anticipates over and then he points away. So I'm just anticipating. I'm just figuring out that his body's going to move over and, and a little bit with the with with his arm. So... Let's just have a look. He's reading, he's reading. What is this, what is this, blah, blah, blah. Going through, you can see him, nice movement. I feel like the body's moving quite nicely. It might be a little bit dramatic, but when he's small on screen and he's animated, it actually helps sell it. And then he points over. The other thing I can do here 
is when he looks at up, the guard's actually kind of to frame left. So I'm just going to come in here. And this is where he looks up right here. So he's down, and then he looks up. So I'm just going to move all these keyframes over in this upward movement here. He comes to there. So in between here, I'm going to move these frames over. And let's go here right before he anticipates over, which is there. OK. So from here to here, roughly, I'm going to tweak these frames so that he's looking more to screen left. I have to make sure I'm on a keyframe. And then I can just sort of I can slide this over. So he's more looking here. And then what I'll do is just sort of I'll tweak the transitions between that right here. So right now it quickly moves over. I just want to grab from this up down position here. I'll delete these frames. And I'll just do an ease, sorry, an ease in. So shift F9. And in, we, I guess I can just press F9 for an ease. So now what will happen is you'll sort of look up over here. And then when he does his descent, this movement here, his head fires back too quickly. So let's just go back over here. He's up, looking over there. And then he fires back a little too fast here because we have a jump between the frames. Fires over too quick. So I'm going to just delete these in here. So I'm just being really quick and dirty, but that's a way that you can sort of fix this out. Oh, um, uh, that's cool. I didn't, so right now I'm getting a tip that you can, I don't know how to say your name, Rebenzi, or I, I don't know how you want to pronounce it. Maybe you can put a phonetic spelling of how you'd like it pronounced. Uh, you can also zero out the values using a Duic option, so you don't have to keep your default value. And it also helps to clean some of the expressions as you don't need to calculate the difference from null, one null to the other. That's a great idea. I didn't know you could do that. That's fantastic. That would clean the expressions up too. Thank you for the tip. That's fantastic. Um, okay, so basically I've animated this guy out. So we've got his his him looking around, doing all that kind of stuff. So then the next thing I can do is I'll animate his hand, right? So we're gonna do the same thing. We'll grab his hand. So let's grab this one right here. Cool. And I'm just gonna puppeteer it once again. I'll, I'll start the capture. And then with this, I'm gonna have him bring his hand down a little bit and then bring it up. And he's kind of reading it. I'm giving a little bit of a waiver. He's pulling the form up, up, up. He's looking at it and then he's gonna put the paper down. And then he's, you know, and then there's gonna be a point where he points, but I can't see it right now because I, I should have zoomed out. But we'll just, again, it's just for an example. So he's reading, 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 reading. And then as he, this is where he should have put the paper down, but he didn't. So I missed the timing a little bit here, no problem. I can either re-record it, which is probably, let's just re-record it, because that's the whole point of this, is that I can re-record really easily. So I'll just undo, make sure I can see everything, and I'm gonna start the capture again. Okay, so he brings the paper up. He's reading, he's reading. Okay, and then he puts the paper down, and then he points away. And that's where we're going to we would transition from one arm to the other. Okay, so reading, 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 reading. This I missed it again because I was not paying attention. So where does where do I bring it down? Right here. I must I bring it down eventually. Wow, I really missed it. So it's here. And then his head looks up here. I want him to sort of start bringing the paper down and put it there. So I'm just going to delete all these frames here. Let's just see what happens. We want, we want the main move down, which is starting there. Okay. I'll just pull these over for now. I find this way of animating a lot more fun. As I'm, okay, so even more, even sooner. So let's get rid of these ones. Delete. Bring this over even more. And I can refill in, I can always m record more motions just by setting my in and out right here. So let's say I need to record more again or change these, I can do that, no problem, by setting my in and out. Um, yeah, thanks for the tip, but you guys, it's cool, this back and forth between Thoros and, and Rebenzi, Reben <laughs> uh, 
that's a good point to if you want to use the zero out button you do that before you start expressions because yeah it'll shift all the math all over the place so i really appreciate that tip i'm definitely going to use it on the next next rig i set up here okay so you can sort of see this is animating moving 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 so my my next thing i usually will do after this is i will start either doing hand movements with the wrist and just adding some like custom frames so like let's say i'm happy with what i did in general oh wait we have one more hand now with this wrist i don't want it to be completely dead right like this hand right here so i would also record some motion start capture and then with this hand i just want him to like sort of reach up for a sec put it down that da, da, da. he's sort of like reading brings his hand up i'm trying to think of how he would move a little bit and then he's when he puts the paper down he kind of goes like this you know and when he points away he's going to like shift his hand weight over you know I, I usually I kind of rehearse this a little bit and I'll do a couple a couple tests and a couple rounds just like you've sort of seen. But then what you can see is hopefully very quickly, even though I'm animating this really fast, you'll start to see this pretty lifelike movement coming from this character that should by all accounts be very rigid. And I can clean some of these up, increase smoothing if you want to, but in general so that arm i want to move at the same time he sort of he brings up his other arm here and that's it i mean i guess that's the downside about trying to use this method right now is that you can't see what you're doing but i actually find it works pretty well it at least gives me the fundamental keys like you can see so for this hand here where it's coming up i would be switching this this hand right here and rotating it a bit so it looks like he's grabbing the paper and i would adjust these values a little bit and just sort of like play with this a bit like I did in the actual characters animation so he's reading 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 puts it down so the next stage the next thing I usually do is the <clears throat> is the breathing so with the breathing I'll just my first step is to really think of what is his state of mind kind of what what is he doing um, these breaths will be on ease ins and ease outs usually for a calm person I do breaths at about two seconds in and two seconds out um, so I'm gonna I would let's say I would start him calm so let's just take a let's give him a breath in so negative two and then you know at four he's like at two we'll just reverse that to two and maybe he's getting kind of excited about it things are getting a little bit more intense we'll bring this back down to two I'm just picking pretty arbitrary numbers and then the other nice thing about the, this the breath controller is that I can use it to help with shoulder movements and stuff like that too, right? So when when he like let's say for this part when he puts his arm down, I can anticipate this with a breath in, right? So put negative two. I think that's a breath in. So we get like this shoulder up and down. So I can time that stuff to sort of to accentuate. Sorry, I keep saying sort of to accentuate the movement. And then when he puts his hand down and it lands, I can bring his shoulders down down and then then bring those shoulders back up again to negative two and then i would use them to help me assist the the movement of his of his arm when he points his arm up so let's just take a quick look and see how that works i find breath sliders actually really valuable in making a character feel more alive it's pretty subtle animation that's really hard to do manually with just keyframes but i find for me it really brings that character like this new level to him Okay, so we'll just play that animation back. I'm sorry, the animation isn't great, but I think I think hopefully you can get the idea of, of in general, how fast it can be. He's definitely wiggling a little bit too much. I moved his reading way too fast. Um, I would have probably done that slower. But there's quite a bit of movement here, and there's a lot of stuff going on. So once his hands are worked out and everything like that, you start to get a better example of what's going on. So I think I think that's kind of that's that's sort of it for this guy. I could go in and animate his eyebrows and keyframe all that sort of stuff. But what I'll do is I'm just going to open up the the animated project that I did do with him. And I'll just show you, again, the animation. I showed it earlier in the stream, but um, I'll just show it really quick. So this is, these are, this is my actual more finished animation. Uh, you can see I don't have a ton of keyframes. I don't have a ton of stuff that I did. There's only a couple of layers that are actually moving around. There's some like these ones are for the switch of the arm 
So it's just not that much, actually. It didn't take me super long to put this animation together. These layers are puppeteered right here, here, and here. I didn't really customize or change too much of them and did a bit of tweaking in the head. But in general, it was, sort of, it was based off the performance that I did with the character. And I'm just going to run this through really quick. I also have this one. I have the offset, the time offset, or sorry, the posturized time filter on it. And that's just to give it more of the feeling of the actual film, which is everything's done on holds and it's a, it's a little bit slower animation. Well, it's on three. It would be called on threes. So most movements are on threes and then some are on twos and stuff like that. But you'll see there's a little bit of detail in the hand in the paper. I added some puppet pins to the finger and the paper is a 3D layer that sort of rotates a little bit. But honestly, you, you don't see most of this animation in the shot because it, the camera's moving so much. Uh, I guess like as far as like a, a layout and recommendation on actually animating, which I always, I run into this problem often, is when, if the camera's moving and there's another character moving in the shot, it's, it's about timing where the viewer's focus is going to be. So you have to pick where your broad movements are. Oh, thanks. I'll, I will call you Ricardo. Thank you. Um... Uh, so the one thing to consider that I have to consider, and I, it's usually hard when you have multiple characters in a space, is who moves when. And that's some of the stuff I still have to tweak out in the final shots. Um, but this, this, so I'll actually, while this is rendering, I'll just go back into this original clip and we'll pull it back up once it's ready. This particular shot is, is kind of a good example of maybe the movements are too many things on top of each other. So you have this guy writing. And then you have this guy taking notes on top of, on top of, you have this other guy taking notes on top of what he's doing. And there's sort of too many broad actions happening at once. And maybe the, the eye, has, it's tricky to know where to focus. Um, my hope is, because I don't have a really good transition that goes from the one scientist to the actual turn, it's not a great transition. So my hope is that your eye kind of pops up there as soon as he turns around. Uh, and it's not focusing on, I really don't want a lot of attention drawn on that rotation right now because it's not, it's not a hundred percent and I don't know if we'll have time to fix it. And in this shot here, um, right here, I had to retime a lot of it so that we see him putting this paper down and having the facial expression and going through the movement and that his arm doesn't move until the camera is settled. So a lot of the stuff that's happening while the camera's moving especially quickly, is just really not a lot of action. And it's the same thing with like eyebrows and stuff like that. You, there's a, one tip that I learned was that when you're animating eyebrows and facial expressions is you don't do them, you don't do, you don't try not to do them on broad movements, right? Um, which is something I always, I have a tendency because I can animate so quickly after I've set up these rigs and it's pretty easy to animate, I have a tendency to over animate the eyebrows and the facial expressions. And you really, don't want to get in that habit of of animating a facial expression change when the character is in the middle of a broad movement because then you don't see that emotional transition that happens in the character. So, for instance, like I have a habit of like like there I furrowed his brows probably too early, but I'm not worried about it because the shot isn't seen. But I also did this thing is when I did his when his eyebrow went up, I initially had to go up just for one second and then it comes down again. And I realized there was just too much activity on his face. It looked like there was these caterpillar eyebrows just with their mind of their own moving all over the place. So it was really, I ended up reducing the number of keyframes that were used on his face in general. I mean, this could use some polish, but again, in the actual shot, it's not, it's not worth it for this specific thing. But like I said, this character would be great for using in all kinds of repeat scenarios. You could use a character that's rigged up like this in a, in a series, you know, it could be used a lot. So I think that's about it for this guy. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, so what I think I'll do is I'm going to stop the stream and then I have to move into putting some backgrounds together. So maybe we can, I, I'll just stop this now and then I'm going to come back on in just a couple of minutes and I will start building a background. So moving out of the character stuff and getting into some full composites. Um, I'll show you actually one of the scenes we're going to be making. Let me just pause this guy right here. I'm going to be working on this scene right here, this painting I did. This is a layered painting done in After or in Photoshop. This has to be put together in After Effects, so I have a whole little train 
that we're putting together, little lights inside of it, it's going to be traveling across this bridge. So there's lots and lots of layers. The, the train has got multiple layers as well, so I have to give it a little bit of depth so that as it travels along, we, we can see it. Uh, see the fact it doesn't just look like a flat, flat thing. So there's this shot that we're putting together and a couple of others. So that'll be the next thing. So I'm going to sign out of this particular stream and we'll start up again in a few minutes. Thanks, guys.